Hey, what's up? I'm so excited to be live and I'm going to see if anybody joins me. Woo. I, uh, I haven't been active on Instagram for the past couple days, but I appreciate you guys showing up. I, uh, it was my birthday yesterday and my boyfriend, birthday is always on July 8th and so we always celebrate together and I kind of took it as a a day to just kind of get away from work um, I also love when people point out so I'll just point it out for everyone I do have a zit on both here and here because I'm human too and um, I just love when people are like you have a zit and you eat dairy that is why and I'm like no I just have a zit because I'm human I'm actually drinking milk right now. It's like sometimes I'll get a headache. I had sushi yesterday and I had fried sushi, which it's not what I have all the time, but whenever I have gluten, I get a headache and uh, I'm paying the price for sure. But I am so excited that you guys have all these questions. Thank you guys so much for the birthday wishes. You guys are so, so sweet and I appreciate your guys' time. Wow, 18 of you already showed up right now. I appreciate you guys. Sometimes I feel like when I go off Instagram, I'm going to like, you guys are going to be like, screw her. She never comes, she never comes on Instagram anymore. Okay. Michelle asks, what are symptoms of progesterone deficiency? Do I need to talk to my doctor before starting bioidenticals? Okay. I'll be honest. Like, obviously I am an online business and I do have to be careful about what I say when I make recommendations. I always say it, it is a good idea to talk to your doctor, but I also do live in the real world and a lot of times when you bring bioidentical progesterone up to your doctor they're like what or they're like oh no that doesn't work that progesterone's just for pregnancy you know i've seen it again and again with clients who ask their doctors about progesterone should so should that keep them from supplementing progesterone in my opinion no um maybe it would encourage them to maybe find a different doctor that's more open but i understand how hard it is to find a doctor that is both knowledgeable in hormones and also on your side and doesn't want to put you on thousands of dollars of protocols and so it's like one of those things where i think it is too good to go into it with an awareness if you can get your progesterone levels tested that's amazing a lot of women do have low progesterone so you have to understand that you're only supposed to have estrogen dominance a couple days leading up to ovulation that's actually what brings on luteinizing hormone coming from your brain and then that luteinizing hormone signals that egg to actually drop and release and that's ovulation right when the egg drops and that's how estrogen signals the brain but the minute that that egg drops you start making that gland the corpus luteum right and the corpus luteum starts making you progesterone which will spike and now become the dominant hormone for the rest of your cycle. That's how it should go. A lot of women, what's happening is they are spiking, their estrogen spiking, it's staying elevated, they either ovulate and make very little progesterone or they, they don't ovulate at all and have no progesterone. And so estrogen's just staying elevated for two weeks. And it's kind of like, I call it the estrogen hangover because then that kind of goes into your, your period, you still have estrogen-y symptoms, and then you have like depression and anxiety the second half of your cycle leading up to ovulation ovulation is horrible and then it just it's this vicious cycle and it gets worse and worse over time because estrogen just keeps it, it's not getting out of the body properly progesterone mobilizes estrogen it is actually what extracts it from your tissues we have to remember that estrogen doesn't stay in the bloodstream that's where it's not that's not where it's stored it's stored in our tissues right and so when we take a blood test or a urine test we're not necessarily seeing the whole picture especially if our progesterone is low because progesterone needs to be present to mobilize estrogen. And this is where bioidenticals come in, is when women supplement with bioidenticals, if you read, you know, you go on whatever, Amazon and read progesterone reviews, you'll find that a lot of women will say, oh, this is amazing, this is amazing, this is amazing. And then you'll find that one lady that's like, this wrecked me. And she like lists all her symptoms and they're all symptoms of estrogen issues, sore and tender breasts, um, uh, vaginal aching, crampy, clotty, heavy periods, depression and anxiety before your period, um, having water retention, I mean, dry skin, hair and nails, low body temperature. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And so those are kind of the main symptoms of low estrogen, anxiety, not being able to sleep well, especially that second half of your cycle. A lot of women have progesterone deficiency these days. And so they also have elevated estrogen. And the reason for this is we have so many estrogens in our environment on top of making our own endogenous estrogen, right? We're making estrogen, we're eating estrogen. I mean, nuts are phytoestrogen 
phytoestrogens. So many plants are phytoestrogens. Herbs are phytoestrogens. I mean, we have so many estrogens coming into our body and then on top of it, we're being exposed to them in our environment. All of that is overpowering progesterone. And then add hormonal birth control into the mix and ooh, you just added more synthetic estrogen into your life. And so even if you've been on it in the past and you never quite recovered, what's stored in your tissues, girl? probably a lot of estrogen. And so in my opinion, I think it is good to start with a baseline test. At least test your progesterone levels once. There are a lot of women that still decide, I'm not gonna do it, I'm just going to try it out and see if it works for me, go by symptoms. I think that's fine too. I think you should take advantage of whatever you feel is right for you. I think a lot of women have seen symptoms improve so much on progesterone. You do have to keep in the back of your mind that if your liver is not moving estrogen well, you can experience estrogen dominant symptoms because that progesterone will move estrogen, but that's not the progesterone in itself. It's what the progesterone is doing. So I think it just really depends on the person. It depends on what you're comfortable with. It depends on how knowledgeable of your body you are. A lot of women don't pay attention to their bodies that well. And so I think in that case, it's probably not a good idea. But if you're really like tracking your temperatures and your pulses and you're looking at how that progesterone is going to directly affect your symptoms and your cycles, I think that uh, it probably would be okay to supplement um, without a doctor. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things where I, I think in personally that I've done it myself. I've seen a lot of clients choose to do it. And it's just kind of one of those things. I think it's a personal thing. Like you get to choose um, what you think is right. And sometimes you don't have access or have the privilege of having a doctor that's going to work with you or help you with that process. Is high LDL cholesterol in blood tests from eating dietary fats? No. So it's actually well known in the medical community that cholesterol is has nothing to do with what your dietary cholesterol. So your LDL and your HDL and your triglycerides have nothing to do with the cholesterol you're consuming. Your liver and your gut manufacture cholesterol, which is a precursor to all hormones, right? So your body makes a master hormone, we call it the mother hormone, called pregnenolone. And the pregnenolone turns into progesterone, cortisol, and DHEA. And then DHEA turns into estrogen and testosterone. And so cholesterol is needed to make pregnenolone. And a lot of times when we have high cholesterol, it's actually a direct reflection of thyroid function because we need, we need thyroid or T3, active thyroid, not just you know, just thyroid function, but T3, we need it to convert cholesterol into pregnenolone. And so a lot of times when we're not converting properly because of a, a thyroid issue, we are actually, we have a lot of cholesterol and it's because of stress. Our body's raising cholesterol, so there's more of a likelihood for it to convert into hormones, specifically cortisol, but also progesterone and also DHEA. And so we have to remember that if we have weird cholesterol levels, whether they're low or high, it's almost always a liver thing and it's almost always a gut thing. Um, mostly liver though, honest, honestly. Usually focusing in on the liver for a couple of months really helps improve cholesterol levels as long as you're also working on the proper fats because we have to remember that the idea that fats cause cholesterol came from the fact that fats that we eat do affect our liver health right so if we eat bad fats we eat polyunsaturated fats too many monounsaturated fats and not enough saturated fats we we really do our livers start to struggle our liver needs saturated fat and it needs sugar too like we're the two things we're demonizing in our culture today are the things our liver needs to function. And, and can you ask me why like all these women who are super into health and wellness and on vegan diets and like gluten-free, plant-based, dairy-free, like all these weird diets and they're coming to me with like worse issues than they've ever had in their lives. And I'm like, because you're cutting the two things that your body needs to function, <laughs> real food. What are the best foods to eat when you're on your period? Ooh, so you really do wanna make sure that you're focusing on uh, getting, replenishing some iron stores. So I always say like well, a big juicy grass-fed steak is an awesome time for when you're, or an awesome thing when you're on your period. Um, it's good to do magnesium rich foods. So whether you make your own supplement, you take some magnesium glyconate, you, uh, bathe in an Epsom salt bath, or you actually make sure you're eating lots of leafy greens. Uh, cacao is really rich in magnesium or cocoa. I think that cacao is just a douchey way of saying cocoa like no offense and then um also um coffee coffee is a wonderful source of magnesium as long as you tolerate it some women actually do better when they cut coffee while they're on their period it just helps with the cramping because caffeine is a vasodilator and so sometimes it can make you cramp heavy and harder or cramp harder 
and bleed a little heavier. And so sometimes getting off the caffeine while you're bleeding can be helpful, but it's not necessary. It's one of those things where you kind of have to know your own body, but really magnesium rich foods, iron rich foods, mineral rich foods like coconut water, OJ, fruits, fruit juices. Those are going to be really restorative, but really light because I know sometimes digestion is a little bit of a struggle while you're on your period and then just rest. So don't push yourself too hard while you're on your period. It's just better to rest more, prioritize your rest. And then if you feel like moving your body, go for it, but don't feel like you need to. And then for me, um, I really like uh, just like, you know, the old school heat. I think that a heating pad is super soothing and super warming and just kind of makes me feel really good. And when I'm on my period, you know, remember, that your left and your right hemispheres of your brain are really connected at the time because your hormones are really low. So you're super intuitive, you're more creative during that time. And so I just kind of take that time to work as little as I possibly can. Obviously, like sometimes my schedule is crazy during my period and I just have to roll with it. And I know a lot of you like don't work from home, you work full-time jobs, you have careers, and I completely understand that, or your students. And so I, what I mean by more taking a rest is like, instead of running to the gym for a workout right after you get off work, why don't you go home, get in some comfy clothes, take a journal, maybe like have a planner if you like something more like laid out for you and just spend some time with your bad self or listen to a podcast or an audiobook. like really just use that time for reflecting on your month. And I think that you're like the most intuitive during that time. It's a really good time to like want to be alone. You're more withdrawn. And so I think that that honestly is one of the best things you can do for when you're on your period. It's more of like a mental emotional thing, but it really does help your periods. Cause I think when we're go, go, go while we're bleeding, we don't realize like how much we're depleting ourselves. Ourselves. Is there any good ways to lower insulin or would it just be to reduce carbs? The funniest thing to me about low carb diets and insulin is just because you're eating less carbs and your insulin levels are lower does not mean you're not insulin resistant. There is a difference, right? Elevated insulin is showing that yes, you are eating carbs and your body's not responding to insulin. When you restrict those carbs, okay, now you're not having an insulin response, but did your cells get any more sensitive to insulin? No, because the issue is not the carbs. The issue is inflammation. The issue is stress. The issue is you're eating the wrong fats. The issue is you're eating too many inflammatory foods. And what I mean by inflammatory is I mean irritating. A lot of people are saying like, oh, leafy greens are anti-inflammatory and all these things. And I'm like, above ground plant foods in excess are going to actually cause more irritation. And they're really hard to digest and break down. So when you're trying to really like get your insulin resistance down, your goal is to actually really balance meals throughout the day. Make sure you're getting enough protein. Make sure that all of your meals contain both protein, carb, and fat. If you're struggling with insulin resistance, saturated fats are where it's at. Plant fats, polyunsaturated fats should be avoided at really all costs because it's going to really affect the way your body burns sugar and responds to sugar. You need to check your T3 levels. You got to know what, what's going on with your thyroid. Your T3 will affect how your body burns glucose and responds to insulin. And then you also, if you have gut issues, that's usually where insulin resistance lies. Endotoxins made by the bacteria in your gut, they're called lipopolysaccharides or LPS. They get absorbed into general circulation and they go directly to the cells and inflame them. Inflammatory cells do not respond to insulin properly. Guess what else inflames your cells? Estrogen. Guess what helps with that? Progesterone. Guess what else needs to happen? Your liver needs to be detoxifying estrogen properly. This is why your liver is the cornerstone of insulin resistance and also weight loss resistance. If you're having a hard time and you've gone to everything, you've gotten your progesterone levels checked, your estrogen checked, your thyroid checked, and you're like, what is going on? I still can't lose weight. I'm still insulin resistant. Always look to the gut and the liver, always because that is where your answer will lie. But something that's very simple that can reduce a lot of toxicity coming from endotoxins is called the raw carrot salad. I implement this in Fully Nourished, my online program that's coming out because it is so powerful. One medium shredded carrot, one tablespoon of either melted coconut oil or MCT oil, which is both antifungal and antibacterial, a couple drops of white vinegar, white vinegar because it's so antiseptic and it's so antibacterial, and then sea salt, which is also antibacterial. You mix that little mixture together, you eat it once or twice a day for a snack, and that will really help bind to a lot of toxins in the gut. But it does need to be done daily to be effective, but it binds to estrogen as well. Two of the things that are gonna really inflame your something as simple as that can be a huge difference. 
Also, just like I said, eating really regularly and making your me sure your meals are balanced. If you're eating too much protein in one sitting with too little carbs or vice versa, you're gonna cause these blood sugar roller coasters that are just gonna constantly cause your body stress. And keep in mind, our whole goal is to stop our body from having to break itself down for fuel because that's what cortisol will rise, adrenaline will rise. That's what those hormones do. They break our tissues down, they eat us alive. And when we're doing that, we're our body's under stress. It's not gonna be responding to hormones properly. There's gonna be inflammation involved and we don't want that to happen. So feed your body well, sleep well, make sure your hormones are balanced and then go from there. But gut and liver is where I would look. But reducing carbs lowers insulin levels. It doesn't help with actually how your cells respond to insulin. I hope I'm making sense there. I know sometimes I can go off on tangents. What should I look for in a good quality coconut water? Honestly, just turn it around, look at the ingredients. If it says 100% coconut water, that's what you want. Sometimes uh, coconut water brands will kind of fool you. They'll be like, oh, this is coconut water, and then you'll turn it around, and it's like coconut concentrate, water, sugar. You just want one thing. You want young coconut water. Some of them will have added flavors, which is fine if you hate coconut water. I know some women are like, that's disgusting. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't used to like it either, and I kind of like learned to like it. Um, but I like the CO2 brand. I like Amy and Brian's. Um, Harmless Harvest is good, but obviously it's super expensive. So it's like one of those things where to me it's like a treat. It's super fun because it's pink, but like, you know, <laughs> is pink really worth $3 extra? No. And then um, there's some other ones. I think Vita Coco, I said that so weird. Vita Coco is sometimes good depending on where you buy it from. Um, and then I think Zico is okay as well. I'd have to check on that for sure. But you're just kind of looking for pure coconut water rather than like some coconut water concentrate type mixture. When is the best time to do an ultrasound on breast before your period or after? You know, because the breast tissue is so sensitive to estrogen, I would probably do it when my estrogen is at my highest. I would do it either like right before I ovulate or mid luteal phase. And yeah, that's what I would do. Like actually probably like more like towards the beginning of the luteal phase. So if you have a regular 28 day cycle, that would probably be like day 12 to 20 ish. If you have a longer cycle, it might be a little farther, but yeah, before ovulation is when you have that biggest estrogen spike. And so you want to test your breasts. If you're doing like a breast ultrasound or some type of breast tissue analysis, I think that that's the best time to, to, um, go because you're going to find the most, um, I guess like weirdness going on there just because estrogen is at its highest and the breast tissue is super sensitive to estrogen. That's just my personal opinion. I've never really thought about it before, but I think that that's what I would do. Could a surge in estrogen cause me to bleed during ovulation? Hmm. Yeah, it could, but a lot of times mid-cycle bleeding is being caused by thyroid issues, specifically low T3. Not always, but sometimes. Um, if it's like a really excessive bleeding and not just like a little spotting, yeah, there could be something going on. Um, I wouldn't say like an estrogen surge. It's supposed to surge before ovulation, but usually a, a, um, a hormone drop is what brings on a bleed. That's what brings on your period. You know, your progesterone levels drop, your estrogen levels drop, and that's what brings on a bleed. It's the same thing as when you're on birth control, you know, that last week of your birth control pack is, you know, nothing. And so your synthetic hormones drop and it will bring on that pill bleed. So it's like the same thing is, um, I would say there's maybe some kind of drop going on maybe, or it could be a thyroid thing. Yeah. It would be really interesting to know. I've seen that in like different hormonal cases. So it could be caused by stress, like high cortisol, high adrenaline, it could be caused by like lack of estrogen detoxification. It could be caused by um, dropping progesterone levels. Yeah, it could be caused by different things for sure. Please remind me what kind of aspirin and dosage you take daily. Also, what time of day? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I, I always preface this by saying like aspirin's not for everyone. It's definitely something you want to talk to your doctor about. Usually doctors are pretty open to low dose aspirin if you are not on like medications that are blood thinners. Um, aspirin is super anti-inflammatory and it's not like other NSAIDs. So a lot of people think like group all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs NSAIDs into one group. Whereas aspirin is just um, like acetosilic acid where, and it was like, invented way before things like Aleve, Advil, and Tylenol, which actually used to be only available by prescription, not over the counter. The minute that those medicines became available over the counter was the minute that they started demonizing aspirin. It was around the same time that they started to realize that aspirin does have some cancer uh, fighting properties. And so 
all of a sudden, aspirin became demonized. All of a sudden. Not going to say why. Who knows? Who knows? But um, it's very effective in fighting prostaglandins. A lot of people these days are promoting fish oil as a, a block for prostaglandins, which I used to be one of them. And as I looked into the science, yes, fish oil does, in fact, or omega-3s do, in fact, block prostaglandins. But at the same time, prostaglandins are made from polyunsaturated fats, where fish oil is a polyunsaturated fat. And so if we're saying, well, yeah, we're taking something because it's technically blocking something, but at the end of the day, our body still makes the thing we're trying to block out of the thing we're taking to block it. I know it's confusing. It's not worth it. And so, you know, I think that aspirin for me has changed my life. Taking aspirin every day, I personally take 325 milligrams, but that's not for everybody. And so it's one of those things where I think it's better if you're gonna experiment with it to maybe talk to your doctor about it, make sure that you're not, you don't have any health conditions or you're not on any medications that could interfere because it is a blood thinner. Um, and then, you know, I personally started at a very low dose, a baby aspirin size, which I believe is 50 milligrams. And I bought a, a brand called Jerry Care on Amazon because it is just starch and aspirin. Whereas a lot of the ones that you'll buy at drugstores are like a million ingredients, like red dye number, whatever, yellow dye, you know, you just, I just want one ingredient and you can cut them in half easily. Um, with aspirin, you do have to understand that it depletes uh, an amino acid called glycine. This is why I'm always promoting gelatin, collagen, bone broth for this very reason. It's rich in glycine. You can also take glycine. It's very gut restorative. I use it in my gut restoration protocols all the time. It's how your gut actually like restores itself and heals itself. It's a precursor to collagen. That's kind of what it does. So you do need to, if, if aspirin is, is sensitive, you're, you have a sensitive digestive system, it's best to eat aspirin with food and always make sure you're getting some source of glycine in every day. And then it is good to remember that um, aspirin does thin the blood. And so taking vitamin K2 is probably a good idea with aspirin. So depending on the dosage, for example, I take 325 milligrams, which is a standard tablet. I always take um, 500 micrograms of K2 or sometimes one milligram of K2 with aspirin, just kind of depending. But aspirin has actually cleared up a lot of my issues. I specifically struggled with a lot of skin inflammation like rosacea and um, uh, keratosis pilaris, and it's like improved tremendously. I also had some uh, like very like itchiness on my scalp, and ever since I did a low carb diet, it really affected my hair, caused like really excessive hair loss. And so I've been trying to grow my hair back, and aspirin has actually been very helpful for that. So it has a very therapeutic. Um, uh, it, it's a very therapeutic thing. A lot of people just don't know because they hear aspirin and they automatically think like the, it's equal to Advil, but it's actually not. And there's a lot of research done that it can help with liver health. It helps with insulin resistance, but obviously I want you to do what's right for you. And this is not a recommendation. It's just kind of me sharing what I do personally. Should I be using DHEA cream if I exhibit estrogen dominant symptoms? That's a good question. Very, very nail on the hammer because DHEA turns into estrogen, like I said. And a lot of times when your body's under stress, your body does tend to turn things into estrogen over testosterone, which is why a lot of women under stress have low testosterone. So, you know, I personally would not because I wouldn't want to risk, you know, DHEA turning into estrogen. But if, you know, some people do find that DHEA helps them um, feel a lot better. So I think it's kind of like a personal thing, but if you're experiencing a lot of estrogen dominant symptoms that got clearly worse when you started supplementing with DHEA, it's probably not a great sign. Can cellulite be reversed once estrogen dominance is more balanced? My gluten thigh cellulite increased drastically in the past six months. Any recommendation for reducing cellulite? Happy B day. Thanks, Lisa. So yeah, cellulite can totally be reversed. I think it's just one of those things where you have to acknowledge it's like Estrogen affects fat storage, it affects water distribution, and that's really what a dimple is. Like, I think sometimes we, like, we really have this, these social constructs of things in our mind. Like, for example, cellulite, like, oh, we just equate it as bad, but, like, I just see it biologically for what it is. It's like if we saw... For example, a horse walking down the road with like a dimpled thigh, we'd think like, that's weird. Like that's not healthy, right? And it's the same thing in humans, um, but it's kind of become accepted as like, oh, this is normal. And I, there is a genetic component for sure, because I think there's a genetic component to estrogen and estrogen detoxification. Um, and I'm not saying that cellulite is something to be ashamed of. We all have dimples. I personally have some cellulite. Everyone has 
cellulite. Like this is a sign that we're actually living and breathing and moving. But there is like a difference between having dimples and having excessive cellulite. And that's the difference. There's nothing to be ashamed of, but we do have to acknowledge it's probably an estrogen issue and a blood sugar issue. So um, that's something that I wouldn't like super focus on. However, I would really focus on like keeping an eye on it and watching how it improves or gets worse, depending on where your hormonal state is. It's just a sign, it's not um, something to like obsess about. There are things that you can do to help. So blood flow, for example, like I personally, body brush daily um and i actually have a fascia blaster which a friend gifted me and it actually is wonderful for cellulite um, a fascia blaster is it is kind of like this weird thing like people love it or they hate it it's sold by this lady like ashley black i think her name is and it is very expensive it's like this like weird cellulite tool she has like a bunch of youtube videos on how to use it but like honestly it does work it does cause some excessive bruising especially when you first use it um because she says it's like breaking up the fascia but like it does work. Um, I can maybe do a tutorial on it one time, but, um, that is really helpful. And then, but for honestly, for me, like whenever I eat like crap and I don't exercise a lot, I do like see that my dimples get excessively worse. And for me, strength training has really changed it. Like I can go do really heavy deadlifts or heavy squats now. Cause I have some muscle definition or I have built muscle over the years. I've weightlifted for over like eight years. So, you know, don't think like you can get like that tomorrow, but Building muscle over time is a really good idea just as a woman, like just make it a point to work out a couple times a week to just build for the sake of building muscle and being strong. But when you build those muscles, you are causing, you know, the water distribution to change, the fat distribution to change, and uh, it can really help with cellulite. So those are some physical things you can do while you're working on the internal things. And then I've actually experimented with um, applying vitamin E topically which can is directly anti-estrogenic and so you can buy it in a um, like a liquid form or a pump form I like the brand unique e and you can apply it topically as well but yeah things that are going to increase blood flow circulation body brushing fascia blasting rebounding like on a mini trampoline actually jumping like moving your lymphatic system and then weightlifting like heavier weights not like you know I'm lifting like five pound dumbbells like yee yee it's more just like lift heavy do some deadlifts do some squats like just lift heavy build those glutes build those hammies that kind of thing could we be low in good estrogen but still be estrogen dominant well here's the thing the thing is it's like it's this weird idea that there are good estrogens and bad estrogens estrogen in excess is just shock it's a shock hormone it's a stress hormone um and we can be low well you have to always look at it in relationship to progesterone so like i've always said like progesterone mobilizes estrogen and so sometimes women will have low progesterone and or low progesterone for their specific bodies so they're experiencing low progesterone symptoms and they have an estrogen test that comes back as low and i'm always just like very cautious about that because there's so many practitioners that will just slap some bioidentical estrogen on that all day and i'm like ee, probably not a great idea you first want to get your progesterone levels back up and then watch and see where those estrogen levels end up because a lot of times once you get progesterone in the picture estrogen starts to mobilize and you don't just like have low estrogen anymore you have like high estrogen or lots of estrogen dominant symptoms so i always go by symptoms over tests i think it's good to use both but i think at the end of the day like i've seen so many women supplementing estrogen or being given estrogen for quote unquote testing low estrogen yet they're struggling with excessive acne excessive clotty heavy periods ovarian cysts just estrogen dominance clearly across the board but they're on estrogen and the minute that they go off of it they feel a million times better they're depressed and anxious and it's all the estrogen so it is possible to be low in estrogen absolutely that is that is something that happens it's just a little bit more rare than the person that is low because their progesterone is low but if it's paired with adequate levels of progesterone and adequate levels of testosterone it could just be low estrogen it can also be low dhea remember dhea turns into testosterone and estrogen and what if you have low dhea your body's not going to turn it into estrogen as much or vice versa remember estrogen can convert into testosterone and testosterone can convert into estrogen in an unhealthy liver and so there's lots of little caveats so it is possible to be low in estrogen but um you always want to go by symptoms if you have symptoms like truly of low estrogen 
okay, but do you? And that's kind of the thing. If you have estrogen dominance symptoms, I definitely wouldn't like hop on a bioidentical train or anything like that. Hi Jess, I've been tracking my cycle symptoms for the last seven months and noticed that one month is a breeze, but the next is awful. And the cycle, good, bad, alternates. Any ideas why this might be? That's super interesting. So I actually see this, I've seen this not commonly, but I've seen it pretty regularly where women will have um, either or. So they'll have either or cycles. It would be interesting to know, so there's a few things that I would check. Are you ovulating every cycle? Sometimes women will like have an ovulatory cycles every other cycle. It's really weird. It's like they'll ovulate one month and they won't the next month. And the the um, an ovulatory cycle is the shitty one. They that's like an estrogen dominant type cycle. And then the next cycle they ovulate and they feel great because progesterone's in the picture, right? Progesterone is going to determine if you have a good period or a bad period across the board. And so, you know, that's that's something to maybe ask yourself, but if you're ovulating each time, that's super interesting. And it would be, there's a lot of things that I would have to think about. Like I'd have to really comb through your health history because at that point you have to kind of see like, okay, what's happening about around ovulation? Because that's really the star of the show. I think sometimes we focus too heavily on the period, but at the end of the day, it's really about ovulation. And if you're really stressed around that time or you're not eating the right nutrients or you're not eating enough nutrients, you're really holding yourself back from making enough progesterone or even ovulating in the first place. Sometimes you can you can start to pinpoint, oh, I'm not sleeping really well this month, you know? So that's why health journaling is important. And in Fully Nourished, I do have a health journal that helps you track your sleep, your temperatures and your pulse, your food. You know, I want you tracking, it's almost like a food mood poop journal because you're tracking how how your food and how your habits are directly affecting your next day or that cycle. And so it is good to kind of pay attention, but I would start to pay attention to what's happening around ovulation that could be maybe causing a progesterone deficiency in that second half of the cycle, which was going to cause your period to be awful. That is a really interesting thing though. I don't see that too regularly. Are there any side effects of taking bioidentical progesterone? Um, yeah, there can be for sure. That's why it's always good to be very careful and cautious with your body, always being like, you know, uh, above and beyond to track how your body's responding to something. Um, a lot of times the the side effects are usually due to what the progesterone is doing, which is mobilizing estrogen over actually like the side effect of progesterone itself, but it can still feel like, wow, I have lots of side effects. So it just kind of depends um, on the person, but yeah, there totally could be side effects, but they're usually like estrogeny side effects, like sore boobs, um, you know, moodiness, um, Sometimes women will actually get an ovarian cyst because cysts are directly caused by estrogen. And like when you start to move that, that they'll like actually get a cyst. Um, some women will see like spotting. Um, so it just kind of depends, but it really like, yeah, it depends on the symptom. Um, but yeah, it can cause symptoms. Anything can cause symptoms in anyone. Everyone's so different. Can you talk a bit more about coffee enema? I've never done one. I'm assuming organic coffee. Should it be cold, warm, etc.? Yeah, so there's lots of information online about coffee enemas. Um, pretty much it's typically, it's a retention enema. So if you're super constipated, it's probably a good idea to clear your colon before you do a coffee enema. Um, that's what I do. And it's always good to ask your doctor. There are certain conditions that are contraindicated or certain times doctors are like, I don't really want you doing coffee enema for whatever reason. Um, but that's again, like up to you to decide. And then what you do is you make a coffee solution, like a concentrated coffee solution. So it's usually two tablespoons of coffee to about three cups of water or so. You boil it for five minutes. You gotta boil it because you wanna just kill anything that's in it. And then you bring it down to a simmer for about 15 minutes. Um, and then you're going to, uh, put some room temperature water in there, bring it up to body temperature. So you don't want it too hot. You don't want it too cold. It's kind of like one of those baby bottle tests. You know, you don't want something boiling hot going up the chute. And then if it's too cold, it'll just make you cramp. Like you're just going to cramp, 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 cramp. And then um, it is a retention enema. So the caffeine is actually going to go through a certain vein. It's called the hepatic vein or the portal vein um, from your gut to your liver. It's going to go through that vein. And it's going to stimulate the liver to produce bile and an antioxidant called glutathione. And as you hold it, your body's going to go, go through that process about five times or so. And then you release it. And that's at that point, there is poop involved. But a lot of people think like enemas just involve poop all around and I'm like, no, you're just going to poop like you normally do. Um, and 
usually women feel a lot better after one they're like where has this been my whole life like what the heck um but some women are like wow like i got chills i got the like the sweats like i kind of felt sick and nauseous and at that point you would acknowledge and you know like oh wow i'm pretty toxic like i've got some toxic junk on the move it is a good idea to maybe take activated charcoal at that point. There's a lot of doctors that recommend like some activated charcoal afterwards to just bind to everything if you feel sick after one. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Like I do one, sometimes I'll, I do one at least once a week. Um, sometimes like multiple times a week, especially if I'm, not, if I'm not feeling good or I'm sick or something like that. Like I'll just do one and it makes me feel instantly better. Um, but yeah, you're pretty much doing room temperature. It's a retention enema and yeah, the first time is just going to be super duper weird, but after that it's going to be a breeze. But yeah, look it up, do a little bit more research. I think a lot of times like reading other people's experiences can be really helpful in like calming our nerves. Like, oh wow, a lot of people do this. I'm not a weirdo. <laughs> I've started eating full fat organic yogurt with a bit of raw honey and a blueberries for breakfast. Is that bounced? Yeah, that's perfect. Sorry, I just burped. Um, yeah, that is so perfect. So you have fat and you have protein and you've got some sugar from the honey and some blueberries for, you know, a little bit of fiber and more, a little more sugar, but mostly just antioxidants. So yeah, that is perfect. That's balanced. Exactly. Um, and it is good. Like when you're doing berries, a lot of people are like, I only get sugar from berries. And I'm like, eh, you're probably not getting a lot of sugar from berries. And so it is good. Like if you're doing just berries for your carb to probably add a little bit more sugar, like in the form of raw honey, like you did, or um a little fruit juice or something like that what are the three most important changes to fix your liver for hormone optimization yeah so that is really good change out your fats that is the first thing I mean that's pretty much the first thing for anything I'm gonna say is like change the fats you're eating I cannot tell you enough how eating saturated fats in the form of coconut oil, grass-fed butter, ghee, and uh, dairy products, and getting out all of the rest of the fats for the most part, obviously you can have some nuts here and there, or whatever you want, but it's mostly getting your fats from saturated sources completely changes your life, completely. Um, it's gonna take a little bit to kick in, but you're like, oh my gosh, I'm burning sugar fat better, I look leaner, I feel better, amazing. Second thing is stop overhydrating. I know it's so counterintuitive and counter contrary to what our culture teaches, but why the heck are we chugging water when we're not thirsty? That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Have you ever seen like a, buff a water buffalo be like, oh God, it's 5 p.m. I got to get my gallon in like, you know, like, no, no, they don't do that. Like they drink when they're thirsty. Watch your dog. Like does your dog like chug a gallon of water a day? No, like he goes to the water bowl and drinks when he's thirsty. It's the same for us. So many women don't understand that when you're over drinking water, your cells have to swell with water in order to retain sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And hydration is completely based on your mineral levels. And if your mineral levels are off, your body cannot function. So your body will actually compensate and you'll be heavy and you'll feel bloated and you'll feel like Ugh, like I'm just like so heavy and what's happening is your cells are just filled with water and so I'm not saying drinking water is bad a lot of people take like what I say and they're just like oh she said like drinking water is bad I'm like no just drink when you're thirsty and it's best to get hydration from better sources juices coconut water bone broth milk if you can tolerate it I mean it's so much better to get vitamins and minerals while you're hydrating your body also food is very rich in water so there's gonna be days when you chow down on some water watermelon you're not gonna be as thirsty on that day as when you don't eat something like watermelon you know and so it's like how does your gallon of water take that into account it doesn't right and so it's best to just drink water when you're thirsty and hydrate yourself from other sources and then the the third thing is well I guess it's gonna be a tie between adding a ton of sea salt to your food and sleeping well I think those are like my two favorite like sea salt is really important most people are not getting enough salt it's so funny to me because like everyone's still kind of afraid of salt and like it's you know like for low blood pressure or high blood pressure and all these things and it's so funny to me because like the minute you come in with a stressful life event like let's say you're in cardiac arrest or you're having a heart attack they shoot you with an IV full of sodium that's the first thing they do yet, yet your doctor's gonna tell you go on a low sodium diet and then the minute that you have a heart attack they're gonna shoot you up with sodium uh, ironic if I've never seen it, you know? So it's like, 
sea salt is so healing and it's so incredible for lowering stress when combined with healthy sugars like that is like the ultimate duo and then on the flip side we also have sleep where a lot of women are not just not prioritizing their sleep but they're not sleeping well so even if you're sleeping you're not you know taking some time before bed to take care of yourself you're not journaling you're not like calming your mind you're just your thoughts are racing you're on your phone you're comparing yourself with that chick on Instagram at like 12 o'clock at night and then you're not really getting good sleep and I just recommend like it's so good to have a bedtime and go to bed around 10 p.m. and sleep between those prime hours of 10 a or 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. you'll feel like a brand new person after doing that for two three four weeks so those are gonna be my four change your fats uh, don't over drink water add sea salt to everything and sleep for sure I always thought cocoa was more processed and cacao was closer to the raw plant. I guess that's what they like want to make you think. I mean, it just depends on where you're getting it. Like cocoa powder that's processed with alkali, like Hershey's, is going to be a little junky. But like cacao is like, I don't know, it's a little more bitter and closer to the source. Any comments on headaches when on the birth control pill? Ooh, um, yeah, so that's usually like an estrogen issue. Anytime you get headaches, it's always due to estrogen. Well, I shouldn't say always, but mostly. Um, or stress, so low blood sugar. Um, vitamin B1 is super helpful for headaches and migraines, as well as just really keeping your blood sugar stable. Sometimes, like, having to eat every two to three hours. And then if it's still there, like, a lot of times, then that is estrogen. Um, so a raw carrot salad, like I talked about, that's going to bind to estrogen. At least eating a raw carrot every single day um, and then supporting liver detoxification so like chlorophyll is really helpful B vitamins whether you do it in the form of nutritional yeast or an actual B complex to support that liver and even grass-fed beef liver is super awesome for um, for your liver so those are kind of my my top tips for uh, supporting uh, headaches what might it mean in my body if I more often feel mood swings and low energy in the first part of my cycle um, yeah, I mean, it usually just means like I've, like I usually say, like estrogen issues, um, that are kind of carrying over. So like I've, like I always say here, it's like that second half of your cycle, you really want progesterone to be that predominant hormone. If it's not, and estrogen is elevated from before ovulation all the way up until you menstruate, you're going to have an estrogen hangover, I call it. It's not like a, a you know, a medical term. I'm just calling it that because you're having excessive estrogen for two weeks instead of two days, and then that's carrying over into the cycle. You're gonna be more inflamed, you're gonna be more insulin resistant, you're gonna have more blood sugar imbalances. I mean, estrogen is, is in excess is just awful for us, ladies. It ages us quickly, it, it causes gut issues. And so this is a, it's almost like a vicious cycle. It gets worse and worse each cycle. The more we have that elevated estrogen in that second half of the cycle, the next cycle is gonna be worse, and the next cycle is gonna be worse, and so on and so forth. And it kind of carries over to itself. And so I would look into my progesterone levels, um, progesterone is kind of that chill hormone it's anti-anxiety it's anti-stress it's it's pro-sleep it's pro-metabolism so i would look into my progesterone levels if, no matter where i'm having moody cycles or where i'm having really rough cycles i would always look to my progesterone levels first and then i would always look to my thyroid just because thyroid is that third ovary and it's almost always imbalanced in a woman that struggles with chronic like mood issues anxiety issues um or just stress issues. So um, yeah, I would look into progesterone and thyroid and then go from there if those are, are um, not imbalanced. What would you recommend for a yeast infection when you don't wanna take Diflucan or a weird cream? Yeah, so I kind of am the person that will take Diflucan if um, it's bad enough, I haven't, I, I, you know, yeast infections, especially if they're chronic, are going to be mostly due to gut issues, like an imbalanced gut is going to cause an imbalanced um, microbiome just about everywhere. Your skin has a microbiome, your vagina, and then your gut, and then your mouth. So, you know, you have different, all your microbiomes are connected. Um, so that is something that probably has a root cause and you want to dig deeper. Keep in mind yeast eats estrogen. Um, so, uh, and, and they will also really work on your blood sugar. Yeast can actually create a 
poison or toxin that can raise blood sugar or lower blood sugar so that your systemic candida, let's say it lives in your sinuses, can get some food even though you didn't eat any any food. Your body can, your, there are yeasts that can actually force you to break yourself down and make sugar um, <laughs> when they don't have any food to eat. So anyways, um, so yeast infection is going to be, I always start with undisalinic acid. That's my first step. Um, Thorn has a really good brand and I usually do like, I want to say the serving size is five and I'll take like 10 twice a day. Doesn't say to do that. So don't take my word for it. Figure out what you need to do, but I like to hit it hard. And then uh, it's a super powerful antifungal. I also do oregano, which is another, it's a really powerful oregano oil. You just need two drops. So I'll do that twice a day. So oregano, undisalinic acid, and um, then what is it? Vitanica has a, um, a suppository called the yeast arrest and it is like a herbal suppository and it works really well. So those three things together usually work super well. Uh, it's good to just kind of have them on hand. So I don't like use them all the way through. I'll just use them until the infection goes away and then I'll kind of keep them on hand just in case something starts to pop up. It's always best to like catch it um, before it gets full blown. Sometimes once it gets full blown, it's kind of one of those things where you might have to take diflucan. Keep in mind that um, antifungals, uh, systemic antifungals are actually kind of good for you if you're not like overdoing it on it. You can kind of get a nice little yeast wipe um, every, every once in a while. Oh, Harmless Harvest is way cheaper at Costco. Thank you for that. I didn't see it, I'm gonna have to look for it. Can DIM be beneficial for certain circumstances and for a limited time? Um, it can be in certain cases, I think. like. I don't think it has that beneficial of an effect. Uh, and if anything, like I've seen more negative outcomes than not, but that's just because like people are just throwing dim at every estrogen issue and just planning on it. Like they act like it like detoxes estrogen where it's one component in many processes of and phases of your detoxification cycle in your liver. So it can be helpful, but I find that there are so many things that are more helpful for liver detoxification. Glycine is really helpful. Um, B vitamins are really helpful. Collagen and gelatin are very helpful. Bone broth are very helpful. Chlorophyll is very helpful. Aspirin is very helpful. Milk thistle is very helpful. So those are kind of like my favorites for liver health over DIM. Um, and then vitamin E is really effective at blocking estrogen. But uh, yeah, DIM can be helpful in certain cases, but if I was going to choose like one of the more like popular estrogen detoxifiers, I would actually choose calcium deglucurate. That's to me a little bit more powerful than DIM um, and a little bit more effective. Calcium deglucurate. Hi Jess, random question, but what are your thoughts on Stephanie Buttermore's all in approach to her to healing her extreme hunger? I haven't seen her like lately. It's so funny because I was like, I didn't say her name, but I had talked about her before. And, you know, she's one of those people that, and I, you know, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not diagnosing in any possible way. But um, her, you know, her body fat percentage has changed so drastically. I can tell by her face, like she's very puffy. She, she most likely has some type of thyroid imbalance. And I've watched her kind of restrict and binge for the past like year or so on and off. I used to follow her a lot. I used to really respect her. And then she kind of just turned into someone that is just promoting binge eating. And a, a lot of people don't recognize that that's what she's doing. Like she acts like she has such a balanced approach, but you can kind of see the physical signs of what's going on just because her muscle is changing and her muscles turning into fat. And even though her weight's not changing, her muscle is turning into fat. And so that's just showing you there's metabolic stress going on. She has a, night, a more puffy face, a little bit more dark circles under her eyes. You know, you can start to pay attention to physical signs if you know what to look for. Like women will get more and more exhausted looking so they'll wear thicker and thicker faces of makeup they'll look less youthful because their body's eating itself alive. You know, we can start to see those things if we know physiology, and I've seen that for quite some time. Um, but I haven't seen her all in approach to healing her extreme hunger. She has extreme hunger because she binge eat, eats. She restricts, she eats, you know, a thousand calories. She drinks Diet Coke and eats, you know, um, Splenda and all this processed, disgusting, low calorie food for seven days that her body doesn't recognize. And then she like binges on just junk food and then does it all over again. And so she has extreme hunger because she's just 
undernourished. She doesn't, she's not eating calorie dense, nutrient dense foods, grass fed butter, coconut oil, um, pastured cream, pastured uh, dairy, wonderful, delicious hard cheeses, um, delicious starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes and potatoes and squashes, you know, drenched in grass fed butter, sprouted, uh, fermented sourdoughs, you know, like delicious, satisfying, nutrient dense food is not in her palate. Of course, she's hungry her body is extremely starving <laughs> of course but I haven't seen that I'll have to check it out thanks for bringing it up and this is not me to bash on anybody like I think that there are so many women out there that really need to acknowledge that they need help and acknowledge that what they're putting out is really unhealthy and there are people looking up to them and watching them and you know they're not understanding that they're not seeing the whole picture and it's not a good, it's not a good thing. Um, I really do like hope that she can just like, you know, make some peace with food and eat some nutrient dense, whole, delicious, satisfying foods. And I, I think that her hunger will go away. <laughs> Hi, so I've been taking my temperature at random times of the day and it's been hovering around 96 to 97, never above 98 degrees. Could this be a sign of thyroid issues? For sure, girl, for sure. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about like subclinical thyroid issues. This is not like a diagnosis. It's just for you to really look and see like, oh, maybe my metabolism is not really working very well because when your cells metabolize nutrients and energy, aka sugar properly, they create heat and we want lots and lots of heat. But when you take your temperatures and sometimes they're normal and you still have symptoms, that's why you want to take your pulse as well because sometimes temperatures lie. Cortisol also provides you fuel by breaking down your own tissues for fuel. So your cells can create heat by breaking itself down, eating itself alive, right? And so when we take our pulses, we can really see that. If our pulse is really, really high, but our temperature is normal, we know that that temperature is high, not because it's good, because our cortisol and our adrenaline are so high. So you have low tense, 96 to 97 is, is I don't want to say horribly low, but that's pretty low. I mean, you want to wake up at 97.8 and above and see that gradually increase throughout the day to, you know, above 98 for sure. So, you know, probably need more sunlight. Are you on a low carb diet? You probably need more sugar. You probably need more carbs. Are you eating saturated fats? Are you eating, uh, sunlight's a big one. Are you over exercising? Um, are you um, stressed out? Like just physical or emotional stress. Um, there's so many things that can happen uh, that are going to cause. So you have to look at your habits throughout the day and then using your temperatures and pulses are a really helpful tool to find what habits are working for you. So for example, like in Fully Nourished, I have you guys implement a bedtime snack and I encourage you to pay attention to how your temperatures and pulses are affected in the morning from what kind of snack you eat the night before. And you'll start to notice like, wow, when I eat carbs, I really don't wake up in a stressed out state. But when I eat nothing before I go to bed, I wake up and my cortisol is through the roof because I have high pulses, high temperatures, or my metabolic uh, health is suppressed. You know, and that's what that is. A low temperature just shows that the thyroid is suppressed. Your body's not metabolizing. Your body's not creating heat. And so a lot of times this is a conversion issue for women. T4, that inactive thyroid hormone, is not being converted into T3. It usually happens in the liver and the gut. And so when that's not happening, mostly because you're not eating enough carbs, sugar, and protein, and saturated fats, that's gonna be the foundational things for liver health, you're not gonna be converting very well. So sometimes just changing your diet alone can really raise your temps. Are you eating tons of green vegetables? Are you eating tons of above brown vegetables? Are you relying upon salads for meals? Salads are not food, guys. Um, they can be a nice complement to a meal. They help you make vitamin K, but they are not a meal. And so like you you really do have to start to say like, okay, am I feeding my body well? Am I actively lowering stress by eating enough salt and fat and and carbs and sugar and, and just food, you know, and, and that's where you would start. Any tips for eye health? Yeah, progesterone is super important for eye health um, because blood sugar balance is going to really affect the health of your eyes. Um, and a lot of times estrogen can wear on the eyes as well as cortisol, adrenaline, just high stress hormones in general. Just think about it as your tissues are being, you know, broken down for fuel. So your eyes are tissues as well. But yeah, obviously eating really good saturated fats, eating lots of, you know, fruits and veggies, vibrant foods. Um, protein from bioavailable sources, making sure you're, you're breaking down your food really well so your digestion is good, and then liver health, absolutely. But yeah, eyes are super um, 
are super indicator of, of where our health is at. Reasons that my face and neck are red a lot, something that bothers me, people comment a lot. Well, do you have high blood pressure is the first question, but, um, or do you overheat easily? Because if you overheat a lot, then that could show like a heat intolerance, usually which is just caused by low T3 or a thyroid issue, um, but it can sometimes be caused by histamine, which is just inflammation in general, like redness and heat uh, can sometimes be inflammation or cortisol, high stress hormones. So it just kind of depends. Um, and for me, that happens like right now, happening because I went from a um if you notice my my face is hot because I went from a session right into this live and didn't have my like afternoon snack and I haven't been sipping on my milk enough and so this is what happens I get a little bit stressed out my body is um you know having to break itself down for fuel cortisol is high and um I am overheating because of that so that is kind of just like perfect example right now I'm showing you in real time. I have problems with really like uh, overheated red face as well. Um, I, it used to be so much worse. Now it just comes out when I'm stressed or when I'm not treating my body well, but inflammation is definitely a driver with that. Uh, that would be my first guess. Thoughts on wild yam creams to help support progesterone? Yeah, that's mostly what bioidentical progesterone is made out of, wild yams. Um, so the wild yam creams are, are usually helpful for progesterone. I know that um, like Emerita, I think is made from that, Smoky Mountain Naturals, I think. And then um, I know Progescence, I think Progescence Plus is that what it's called? I think the Young Living Essential Oils sells one that does have some wild yam in there. I prefer to just know, I, I always prefer to get something that has a direct, like for example, if I'm taking progesterone, I just wanna take progesterone. I don't wanna mix it with a bunch of herbs cause that like leaves a lot of room for error. You don't know what's actually causing problem and what's actually helping you. But yeah, wild yam is usually what bioidentical progesterone is made out of. Weird. I have consistently low blood pressure, 97 over 51. Is this something to be concerned about? Potential causes. Yeah, it's usually caused by stress, honestly. Um, a low pulse, you know, low blood pressure. Your body's not pumping blood or oxygen or nutrients through the tissues as it should. It's usually caused by stress. It can actually be caused by, I'm gonna say it, low progesterone, um, elevated estrogen, but it's usually caused by elevated cortisol or adrenaline. Even if it was happening, it happened in the past and now you actually just have a low stress hormones, like you're just kind of more down in the dumps. Um, but yeah, it, it can help. Uh, something as simple as actually sea salt and potassium can really help regulate blood pressure levels. So um, sometimes people are just not getting enough salt in general and their body's under so much stress, so they're burning through nutrients super quickly and um, they need to replenish and they're not really working hard to replenish. And something as simple as just liberally salting all your foods can really, really help with that. How do you know when you're eating the right amount of carbs? You feel really good and you don't ever crave sugar. You can eat, you can open up a box of cookies and you can eat one cookie and put it away. Or even better, you look at cookies and you're like, hey, what up? And you move on. That's when you know you're eating enough carbs. If you're a carb monster and every time you get exposed to carbohydrates, you binge on them or you go crazy with them or you can't stop or you can't control yourself around them, there's a problem you are not getting enough carbohydrates. If you're craving sugar or you're craving carbohydrates, you're not getting enough sugar. You're not getting enough carbohydrates. It's as simple as that. If you have a lack of self-control around carbs, there's a problem. Um, and that's really the biggest thing is someone can set a plate of donuts in front of me and I'm like, me. Whereas I used to be a sugar monster when I was on like low carb and keto and even paleo, I would literally like dream of like chocolate chip cookies and I would constantly be making like paleo desserts, keto desserts. And now like maybe once in a blue moon, I'll have like one sugar craving here and there, but that's really where you wanna be as a woman, like a sweet spot, which is you don't really crave carbs. That That's really a great sweet spot. And when you do, you just want some. I got a GI map test done and my sulfite levels were really high. What does that mean and how do you bring those down? Um, sulfite, that's really interesting. Um, did, I don't really recall sulfite being on a GI map. Um, maybe it was a different marker. Yeah, sulfite. Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't remember that being a marker. 
What can you do to lower testosterone? Um, you can balance your blood sugar. You can lower stress by eating more balanced meals, eating more regularly every two to three hours, eating more sea salt, um, eating more potassium rich foods like orange juice and coconut water, um, doing lots of carbs from root vegetables and fruits, um, and getting lots of saturated fats in. But mostly just feeding your body and treating your body well is it can work wonders for testosterone levels. Okay, guys, Instagram's going to cut me off, but I'll go live for another 30 minutes. If I don't get to your question, I'll go live again once it cuts me off, and I'll, uh, you can re-ask your question. How much sea salt should con we consume a day? Is Himalayan salt as beneficial? Himalayan salt is just a little less pure. There's more iron in it. There's more minerals, and I'm not against it, but if you can do sea salt, it's just a little better. Um, and you wanna just do as much as you crave. If you ever crave like salty, crunchy foods, you need salt. But yeah, I just, I always add it to everything. Uh, when I work out, I add it to my beverage. I just add it to everything. Okay, RJ, I'm gonna get to your questions uh, on hot flashes in the next one.